At last, I'm free from that weight. As of today, my parents are moving in with me at my house. When they passed away, my husband, Scott, made an unthinkable decision. He demolished our family home and, standing in front of the ruins, blurted out, hurry up and bring the inheritance to our place. I stood there, stunned. What are you talking about? Have you lost your mind? I asked, barely believing my ears. As his words sank in, I couldn't help but laugh. I finally understood what this was all about. Scott, along with my in-laws, stared at me, confused. That's when I decided to reveal the truth. My name is Amy Jackson. I was born the eldest daughter to parents who lived simple lives, both office workers. I have one brother, and together, we made up a very normal family. I married Scott when I was 30, and we had two children, Eric and Judy. Life became a blur of balancing work and raising kids, and before I knew it, I was 52. By then, Eric and Judy had grown into independent adults, each starting their careers and living on their own. It felt like the time had finally come for me to relax and enjoy life with Scott. It was an ordinary existence, but I was happy. I assumed things would carry on this way as we both aged. Then one winter day, everything changed. My father was in a car accident and he passed away suddenly. He was only 68, the grief hit our entire family hard, but my mother took it the worst. She was so depressed she could barely eat. Mom, you have to eat something. I would tell her over and over, but she would always respond the same way. I know, but I just don't have the appetite. It feels like there's something stuck in my chest. My brother and I assumed it was simply the weight of her grief, and for a while, we just watched her struggle. But when she rapidly lost weight in just three weeks, my worry grew. I took her to the hospital, hoping for reassurance, but instead, we received devastating news. Cancer. It was advanced and surgery wasn't an option. She had about a year left to live. I hadn't even had the chance to properly take care of my parents. Just as I was reeling from losing my father, now my mother was battling a terminal illness. I was more devastated than I had been at my father's passing, but I knew I couldn't grieve forever. My brother lived far away and couldn't be much help, so the responsibility of caring for our mother fell to me. I approached Scott, telling him I wanted to move in with her. I couldn't bear the thought of leaving her alone during such a difficult time, both emotionally and physically. But Scott's response wasn't what I expected. We just dealt with your dad's funeral, and now I have to get dragged into more of your family's problems? He sighed, clearly annoyed. You don't have to put it like that. I replied, trying to stay calm. Can't we just take her to and from the hospital? Do we really need to live with her? Scott's frustration was mounting. She might feel lonely. I added softly. If it's too much, maybe I could stay at my family home for a while. But Scott's indignation only grew. And who's going to take care of my meals while you're gone? He snapped. I'll come and cook for you, I offered. And what about cleaning? Laundry? Who's going to handle all that? He demanded, and I fell silent. I had every intention of doing as much as I could, but the reality hit me hard. I couldn't do it all like before. And hearing him say it hurt even more. If anyone accused me of being selfish for wanting to care for my mother, I wouldn't have had an argument to defend myself. My mother, always considerate, would likely say everything was fine, but I couldn't ignore the feeling that I needed to be there for her. Fine, Scott finally said, though his voice dripped with resentment. But I'm not helping with any of it, got it? His attitude was arrogant, but at least he agreed, and that was all I needed for now. I'm sorry and thank you, I said, though the words felt bitter in my mouth. Even though I thought he was being unfair, I swallowed my frustration and thanked him anyway. Despite the tension, Scott and I moved in with my mother at the family home. Before that, we'd been living in a house provided by Scott's employer. As an only child, Scott had always planned to live with his parents, and since his father was keen on the idea, we hadn't bothered buying a place of our own. The company housing had been convenient for work, and at just $11,000 a month, the rent was hardly a burden. Now that we were living in my family home, there were no rent payments and we had more space. I think, in some ways, Scott didn't mind the change. Living here wasn't entirely bad for him. Scott kept his promise. He didn't lift a finger to help. But I was still glad to be with my mother. On some days, she seemed full of energy, but more often, she was weak and spent much of the day resting. I took care of everything, preparing her meals, feeding her and managing her medication. There was no way she could have handled it all on her own. I'm sorry, Amy. Thank you, she would say often. It's such a big help to have you here with me. I should thank Scott too. My heart ached at her words. 
She had no idea how harsh Scott had been about the situation, and yet, she was grateful to him two point one evening, after my mother had gone to bed. Scott came home, and I tried to bring up my mother's treatment while serving him dinner. Without missing a beat, he shot me an icy glare. I don't know what you want from me, he snapped. I told you, I'm not helping with any of this. His refusal to even listen cut deeply. I wasn't asking for much. I just needed someone to talk to, someone to confide in. But Scott had shut himself off completely. Two months passed, then three, and nothing changed. He kept complaining about living together, acting as if he was doing me an enormous favor by simply existing in the same house. With each passing day, his behavior became more unbearable. I didn't have the strength to argue with him. I was too consumed with worrying about my mother, and on top of that, I was trying to be considerate of Scott's feelings. The stress weighed heavier on me with each passing day. As we neared the two-year mark of her prognosis, my mother's condition suddenly worsened, and she was hospitalized. Five days later, she passed away. Even though I had tried to prepare myself for this moment, the loss was devastating. My brother's family and my children rushed to my side to help with the funeral arrangements, but during times like these, all you want is for your spouse to be there for you. Scott, though, was nowhere to be found. Instead, he was off in a corner, laughing and chatting with his parents, offering no help at all. Thankfully, my brother stepped up and took charge of the funeral preparations, and somehow, we managed to get everything in order. But Scott, who should have been seated with me in the family section, chose to sit at the very back with distant relatives. Scott, come sit in the family section. I urged him quietly. He just shrugged. No, I'm fine back here. I'm not a blood relative anyway, he replied. But you're my husband, I insisted. Just then, his mother chimed in. He's your husband, Amy, but he's not your mother's son. Scott belongs here with us. He's an outsider when it comes to your family. Her words stung deeply, leaving me speechless. Hearing that from my in-laws in such a delicate moment was more painful than I could have imagined. Where I come from, it's customary for sons-in-law to sit with the family during funerals, though I knew this might vary by region. With Scott choosing not to sit beside me, distant relatives began whispering, wondering if we had separated. It's one thing for people to gossip, but all of this could have been easily avoided if Scott had just taken his place next to me. Feeling a deep sadness that my own husband wasn't by my side, we still managed to bid farewell to my mother peacefully. After the funeral, my brother's family, my children, Scott, and his parents returned to my family home. Thank you for coming, especially during such a busy time, I said to my in-laws as I offered them tea. They laughed and replied, really, it's something. First your father, now your mother. These funeral expenses are a burden for us too, but at least that's the end of it. I was stunned by their callousness. What did they mean by that? I couldn't believe they would say something so heartless. Forcing a smile, I excused myself, but just as I stepped away, I overheard Scott talking with his parents. It must have been tough for you, Scott, living with outsiders, his mother said sympathetically. Yeah, dealing with Amy's whims was such a pain, Scott responded casually. My fists clenched in anger. A husband shouldn't just follow his wife's demands. If you don't like something, you've got every right to refuse, Scott continued, with a smug tone in his voice. Their laughter echoed through the house, unbearable. But this wasn't anything new. Scott's parents had always been insensitive and rude. When we got married, his mother had said, couldn't you find someone more attractive? His father had joked, beauty gets boring after three days, but with Amy, at least you won't get bored. And Scott, he had just laughed along. Looking back, neither Scott nor his parents had ever offered a single word of comfort, not at my father's funeral, and certainly not after my mother passed. Instead, they only ridiculed me for so long, I had felt guilty for imposing on Scott. But now, I found myself questioning his behavior, not just as a husband, but as a person. I had spent so much time worrying about Scott's feelings, trying to be considerate, all while just wanting to do right by my mother. Now, I realized that I had no reason to feel guilty, especially since he hadn't supported me at all. As I simmered in anger, Scott and his parents carried on laughing and chatting in the other room. If my brother's family or my kids had heard them, they would have been just as upset. But luckily, they were in the kitchen, and I was the only one who had to endure hearing their cruel conversation. Then, out of nowhere, my mother-in-law's voice cut through the room. Amy, she called. Yes, I replied, startled. Can I have this? She asked, holding up my mother's purse. I stared at her, confused. Well, your mother won't be needing it anymore, right? 
Scott suggested I take it home. Maybe I'll just keep it, she said casually, inspecting the purse as if it were an item in a store. I couldn't believe her audacity, especially right after the funeral. Stepping forward, I took the purse from her hands. No, you can't, I said firmly. Her face changed, not because she wanted the purse so badly, but because I, her daughter-in-law, had dared to stand up to her. But I held my ground, we're not ready to go through my mother's belongings yet. I continued. We'll distribute her keepsakes among the family later. My mother-in-law's face flushed with anger. What do you mean by that? Are you saying I'm an outsider? She demanded. Didn't you say at the funeral that Scott was an outsider to my mother? So why is Scott considered an outsider, but your family isn't? I shot back. Scott and his father turned red at my words. What are you saying? Apologize to mom. Scott barked, outraged. How disrespectful of you to speak to her like that. Their raised voices drew everyone from the other room into the commotion. I hadn't expected to be called an outsider after everything I had done. Let's go home, dad. My mother-in-law shouted at me, furious, and stormed out of the house in front of everyone. To my surprise, even Scott was angry, following his parents out without a word to me. As soon as they left, my brother and children looked at me, confused. What happened? Did you really call your mother-in-law an outsider? They asked. Since they had only overheard her side of the argument, it might have seemed like I was being the harsh one. But once I explained the whole situation, not a single person blamed me. Grandpa and grandma should be more considerate of other people's feelings, my son muttered, while Judy nodded in agreement. That's just how dad, grandma, and grandpa have always been, she added. My children stood by my side, but despite their support, I couldn't shake the anger I felt towards Scott and his parents. Since that day, Scott hadn't come home, and I hadn't reached out to him either. I didn't think I should be the one to apologize, and even if he did, I wasn't sure if I could ever forgive him. But I also knew things couldn't stay like this forever. Then, one day, Scott finally came back. Welcome home. I greeted him, though I had to suppress the anger that surged up the moment I saw him. It's been tough, huh? He muttered, his voice gruff, as if trying to show some semblance of concern. I was caught off guard. Take the kids and go on a trip. A change of scenery will do you good, he said, handing me a set of travel vouchers. I was speechless. Tears welled up in my eyes, and I couldn't stop them from falling. It might have been the kids' idea, but the fact that Scott had gone along with it touched me deeply. I called the kids right away to plan the trip. Really? Dad suggested this. Eric asked, astonished. It's surprising, isn't it? I laughed. It genuinely seemed like this was a gift from Scott, and I wondered aloud. Maybe Dad feels bad about what happened. The thought made me chuckle. Grateful, I accepted the travel vouchers from Scott. I'll be off then, I said. Yeah, take your time. Stay with the kids at their places too if you like, Scott suggested. Really? I can't be away that long, I protested. Don't worry about me. I'll relax at my parents' place. Just enjoy yourself, he replied, and with that, Scott set me off. Judy was thrilled to have me visit, so before the spa trip, I made a stop at her place, and then at Eric's. I hadn't been able to visit them often while caring for my mother, so I tried to help out by cooking and freezing some meals for them. Mom, you should relax, but thanks, this really helps, they both said, clearly delighted to have some of my homemade meals at home. This chance to reconnect with them was all thanks to Scott's suggestion. Finally, the long-awaited spa trip arrived, and I spent a relaxing time at the hot springs with my children. The exhaustion from caregiving, and even the sorrow of losing my parents, seemed to lift a little during those peaceful days I was away for almost a week, and when the trip ended, both of my kids returned to their homes with bright smiles. That was fun. We should thank dad, for once, Eric said. True, just this once, Judy added with a smirk. But I wonder if he's up to something. I laughed. Don't say that. Dad was thinking about us in his own way. I replied, amused by their banter. When I returned home, ready to share my happy memories with Scott and to restart our life together as a couple, I was stunned. The house, what had happened to the house? I stood there, speechless, staring at the spot where my family home should have been. It was gone. Out of nowhere, Scott appeared, with his parents trailing behind him. They were grinning as I stood there, frozen in disbelief. Scott, what's going on? I asked, my voice shaky. Scott's smile twisted into something sickening. Finally, I'm rid of that baggage. Starting today, my parents are moving in with me at my house, he said, beaming. What are you talking about? I asked, struggling to stay calm. Have you lost your mind? Your family home has been demolished, Scott said, 
almost gleefully. Now hurry up and bring the inheritance to our place. Whatever you inherited, it's mine now. In that moment, the truth sank in. The disappearance of the house was Scott's doing. All for the inheritance. Betrayal washed over me. I had been thinking about our future, imagining a new start with Scott, and instead, I came home to this. Indescribable sadness and fury churned inside me, but I knew one thing. Demolishing the house wasn't going to work in Scott's favor. I wouldn't let it. I suddenly burst into laughter at the absurdity of the situation. Their smirking faces only fueled my amusement. Scott and his father looked at me, baffled. Why are you laughing? Scott asked, confused. Has she gone mad? My mother-in-law muttered, eyeing me as if I were some eerie creature. Facing the three of them, I finally spoke. Do you even know what you're talking about? I haven't inherited a single penny. There's no inheritance. With that, I burst into laughter again, unable to contain myself. They had mistakenly convinced themselves they'd strike it rich, and their wild imaginations and rash actions only made the situation more ridiculous. What do you mean? Explain yourself, Scott demanded, his face twisted with frustration. But I stayed silent. I saw no reason to enlighten them. Instead, I looked at Scott, calm and firm. Before anything else, I'm not living with strangers. If you want to live together, go ahead alone. Ignoring Scott's question and outright rejecting his plan only made my mother-in-law more furious. You helped with your parents' housework, but you won't help us? You know the circumstances, don't you? I agreed to live together, didn't I? She shouted. I told you I never wanted to live together. Have you forgotten? You were the ones who pushed for it just to avoid doing the housework. I shot back, my anger rising. And demolishing the family home like that? There are some lines you don't cross. My voice rang out, filled with rage. Without another word, I turned and walked away. I heard Scott call after me. Where are you going? But I didn't look back a T that moment. All I needed was a place to stay for the night. The last thing I wanted was to see Scott's face. I immediately consulted a lawyer because demolishing a house couldn't be that simple. The house was still in my mother's name after all. As I dug deeper into what happened, an unbelievable truth came to light. Scott and his father had demolished the house themselves. His father, who worked in demolition, had enlisted the help of some acquaintances and even rented heavy machinery. The planning was meticulous, cold, and calculated, AT that moment. All I needed was a place to stay for the night. The last thing I wanted was to see Scott's face. I immediately consulted a lawyer because demolishing a house couldn't be that simple. The house was still in my mother's name, after all. As I dug deeper into what happened, an unbelievable truth came to light. Scott and his father had demolished the house themselves. His father, who worked in demolition, had enlisted the help of some acquaintances and even rented heavy machinery. The planning was meticulous, cold, and calculated ND, as if to add insult to injury, they had given me those travel vouchers just to get rid of me while they carried out their plan. Tears welled up in my eyes as the weight of their betrayal hit me. The frustration and anger were unbearable. Is there any way to punish them for this? I tearfully asked my lawyer. He smiled kindly and reassured me. Scott unlawfully demolished the house that was still in your mother's name. He could be charged with property destruction and held liable for damages. Let's start by demanding a formal apology from Scott and his parents. I nodded, feeling a sense of relief as the lawyer swiftly began taking action. A few days later, Scott called, furious. What's with this certified letter? He shouted into the phone. Oh, you got it? You destroyed my family's house, so of course, you have to compensate me. I replied calmly. Compensate? We said we were moving to my parents' place. I demolished a house that nobody was going to live in. You should be thanking me, not asking for compensation. Now, bring the inheritance and come back home, he said arrogantly. I couldn't believe his audacity. Thank you for demolishing my house. Don't make me laugh. And what inheritance? It hasn't even been settled yet. I yelled back, my anger boiling over. Scott went silent, seemingly shocked by the anger in my voice, something I rarely showed. The reason I had laughed when the house was demolished was because of this very moment. I had spent an entire year with my mother, and, of course, we had discussed inheritance. I told my brother I didn't want any part of it and to keep everything for himself. As a result, he inherited all the cash and stocks. He had insisted that I should keep the house, since he lived far away and couldn't manage it. If I didn't want to live there, we had planned to rent it out. That had been the plan all along. Either you and your father restore the house to its original state, or pay the amount specified in the letter. I was considering settling this amicably. I warned him, but if you can't pay, I'll file a police report and sue you. I'm sorry. I didn't think you'd get this angry, Scott stammered, starting to backtrack. Of course, I'm angry. What did you expect? I snapped. Scott had clearly thought that demolishing the house would get him out of living with his parents. 
His father had always wanted them to live together, especially since he had a particular fondness for Eric. Scott had always refused to live with his parents before, claiming the commute would be too difficult, but his parents had blamed me for the decision. He must have thought that by demolishing my family home and making it seem like I would bring the inheritance, I'd be forced to move in with them. But after hearing his twisted logic, I knew I couldn't forgive him. Please give me a break. I didn't mean any harm. Dad's sorry too, Scott pleaded. If you're truly sorry, then agree to the settlement. I said firmly before hanging up the phone. Scott kept calling and texting, apologizing over and over. But I had no patience for his empty words. If you're sorry, just transfer the money, I told him, pushing him away emotionally. I knew that no amount of money could restore my childhood home, but this was the only way I could cope with the unbearable betrayal. I stayed at Judy's place for the time being. My brother, his family, and my children were all aware of the situation. My brother, who had every right to be furious about the house being demolished without his consent, took a measured approach. I won't interfere, but I'll help however I can. Do what you think is best, Amy, he said. Everyone stood by me, condemning Scott's actions and offering their full support. A month went by without a single payment from Scott, no compensation, no alimony. Worse yet, I hadn't heard from him at all. I knew I couldn't stay at Judy's forever, and I wanted to get the money as soon as possible, at least to establish a stable foundation for myself. But just when I thought things couldn't get any more shocking, Judy showed me something that made my heart sink. This apron looks a lot like grandma's, she said, holding up her phone. I took a look and, to my horror, it was a listing on a flea market app. The apron was unmistakable. It was one I had made for my mother, a unique piece. My stomach dropped. This is grandma's apron. I made it myself, I'm sure of it, I said, my voice shaking. Judy quickly scrolled through the other listings. The seller was new, with no transactions or reviews yet, but there were nearly 50 items posted, and to my horror, every single one of them belonged to my mother. It hit me immediately, it was Scott. He was the only one who could have taken my mother's belongings after demolishing the house. I picked up my phone and called him right away. What's this about the app? I demanded. App. Scott replied, sounding irritated. Don't play dumb. You're selling my mom's things without permission, aren't you? Cancel those listings right now. I ordered, furious. Scott's voice grew panicked. What? No, it wasn't me. He protested. Then who else would do such a thing? I fired back. I'm coming over right now to get everything back, I said before hanging up. Without wasting a moment, I headed to Scott's parents' house with Judy in tow. The second we arrived, I confronted him at the door. Where are my mom's things? I demanded. Scott stammered. I don't know anything about it. Tell the truth, Dad, Judy said, joining me and pressuring him. Scott looked flustered, caught in his lie. His parents, noticing the commotion, came outside. Oh, Judy, you're here, Scott's mom said, smiling at the sight of her granddaughter, completely oblivious to the tension. Judy, visibly angry, turned to her grandmother. Grandma, tell Dad to tell the truth. The truth about Grandma's belongings, Dad seems to be selling them, she said, her voice firm. At Judy's words, Scott's mother suddenly burst into laughter. Scott, looking troubled, kept repeating, it really wasn't me. Then, with a loud voice, his mother proudly announced, Scott selling them? That's impossible. I'm the one selling them. My blood ran cold. Scott's troubled expression confirmed my suspicions. He knew. He looked at his mother with a face that said, this is bad. Despite Judy's shock, Scott's mother continued cheerfully, as if nothing was wrong. What? It's a lot of work, you know? I have to pack everything carefully and make sure the photos look good, she said, completely oblivious to the fact that she was selling stolen goods. She happily chatted about the app, as though she was proud of her efforts. I clenched my fists, struggling to keep from lunging at her. Cancel the listings. Those aren't yours to sell. Judy shouted, her voice trembling with both anger and tears. But Scott's mother just frowned. What's the big deal? I finally found a hobby I enjoy, she replied, as if her actions were harmless. I use what I can and sell the rest for a little pocket money. It's good for preventing dementia. I'm the only grandma left, so Judy wants me to stay healthy and live long, right? She said, completely nonchalant. Pleading with her was useless. She showed no remorse, no understanding of the gravity of what she had done. Realizing that talking wouldn't get us anywhere, I decided to take action. Judy, let's go, I said firmly. But mom, Judy started. It's okay, let's go, I repeated, pulling her away from the house and heading straight to the police station. I hadn't planned on filing a report for the demolition of the house, but theft was a different story. When I explained to the police that my mother's belongings were being stolen and sold online, they took swift action. 
Scott's mother's account on the flea market app was suspended, ensuring the items wouldn't be sold any longer. On the way back from the station, I called Scott. I had your mother's account stopped, I told him. You knew about it, didn't you? You're complicit. No, I, I didn't know, he stammered. Well, I've filed a police report about the theft. You'll need to cooperate with the investigation, I said sternly. Scott became frantic. What? We're family, right? Please, withdraw it. We can sort this out. Family? I cut him off. You still haven't paid a single cent in compensation for the house or alimony. And there's been no sign of any remorse from you. My voice rose, and Scott fell silent, taken aback. Despite everything, I realized I still had feelings for him after all these years together. I sighed. I'll wait for the money, but I won't forgive the theft. Return everything. And Scott, your father didn't look well. Has he seen a doctor recently? What? Scott muttered, surprised by my sudden concern. I'm not a monster, Scott. I'm just passing on the message, I said and hung up the phone. Scott's father, whom I had just seen, had looked alarmingly thin. He hadn't spoken much, and his complexion wasn't just pale, it was unnaturally dark. His ill health was obvious, but I doubted that Scott's family had even noticed. His mother was too busy selling stolen goods without a care in the world, and Scott only seemed to care about acting tough with me. They lacked any real concern for anyone but themselves. The next day, I received a call from Scott's father. I had expected it to be a call of thanks, given the circumstances, but what I got was the complete opposite. What do you mean by treating me like a sick person, he barked. Are you planning to dump me in a hospital just to get rid of me? I need to protect Scott and my wife from you. I'm not going to any hospital, he scolded, his voice filled with indignation. I was shocked. All I had done was express concern, and yet here I was, being reprimanded as if I had done something wrong. I'm sorry for overstepping. I was just worried. I replied, trying to stay calm. Humph. I'm not frail or short-lived like your parents. Don't make a fool of me, he snapped. His words infuriated me, but I let them slide. A few days later, however, he felt unwell enough to go to the hospital. The diagnosis came back. Terminal cancer. Scott called me in a panic. Dad's got terminal cancer. What am I going to do? He cried. I let out a bitter laugh. I don't know, Scott. What did he say when I suggested he go to the hospital? He said, I'm not frail or short-lived like your parents, so deal with it yourself. How can you be so heartless, Amy? I never thought you'd turn out like this. Scott exclaimed. His accusation stung, but I couldn't let him get away with it. Heartless? Did you or your family say a single kind word when my mother was sick? Reflect on your own actions before judging me. I snapped, and with that, I hung up. As I had expected, Scott's father passed away shortly after. As much as I wanted to be a better person, free of resentment toward the deceased, I couldn't shed a tear for him, not after everything they had done. After the funeral, his will was read. Despite his claims of not being short-lived, he had made thorough preparations. The house went to Eric, while the rest of the estate was to be divided between his wife and eldest son, Scott, asterisk. I was surprised to see Eric's name in the will. Scott's father had always favored him, probably hoping that even after his death, Eric would live in the house. To me, it seemed more of a burden than a blessing, especially with the inheritance taxes that would follow. Renounce the inheritance, Eric. You don't need that house, do you? I suggested, trying to spare him the hassle. But Eric was happy to receive it, and I knew I had no right to argue with his choice. So, Eric inherited the house, and his grandmother, seemingly overjoyed, paid the inheritance tax. He's our successor after all, she said proudly. While she wasn't wrong, a small part of me felt sad, as if Eric was being taken from me and pulled further into Scott's family. Then, something unbelievable happened. I received a call from Scott. Come over to the house now, he said, his voice filled with urgency. Curious and a little worried, I headed straight to his parents' home. When I arrived, I saw Scott and his mother standing outside, both frozen in shock just like I had been not long ago. The scene in front of me was all too familiar. Heavy machinery, demolition trucks, and workers tearing down their house right before their eyes. What's going on? Scott yelled, bewildered. That's when Eric appeared, a look of satisfaction on his face. It's my house, he said calmly. I can do whatever I want with it. Eric, what are you doing? Stop this right now. Scott screamed, his voice desperate. Eric didn't flinch. Stopping it now won't make the house livable again anyway, he replied calmly, watching as the demolition continued. 
Scott's mother and Scott fell to their knees, pleading with Eric to stop. But Eric just laughed coldly. Did you forget what grandpa and dad did to mom's house? Grandma, you were just as awful to her too, weren't you? Did either of you ever apologize for that? Eric's smile faded, replaced by a sharp glare directed at both of them. As the noise of the heavy machinery echoed around us, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief wash over me. The house that had represented so much pain and betrayal for me was finally coming down. Justice, in its own way, I and the end, Scott finally paid the damages and compensation, using the assets he had inherited. Eric, true to his word, retrieved all of my mother's stolen belongings from Scott's mother and returned them to me. As he handed me my mother's things, Eric smiled and said, You always have me and Judy. For the first time in what felt like forever, I let the tears flow. Tears of relief, not sorrow. With their house gone and no money left, Scott and his mother had no choice but to move back into the company housing. It was ironic, really. We had moved out of the company house, but now Scott and his mother were forced to return, becoming the subject of gossip and rumors. Karma had come full circle. Asterisk, 